All right, folks. Welcome back. It's uh, time to do a Bible study again. As you can see on the slides there, this is part three of our discussion called, Did You Know This About the Millennium? And if you'll remember, I've been trying to get to these points for a few weeks now. We've had the two parts before on which we focused on what the boundaries are for the millennium, the beginning and the ending time frames, if you would, in the Bible. And of course, remember the last two times we met, we've read Revelation chapter 20, and we ended last week with reading Revelation 21, and we talked about the, the first resurrection and the second resurrection and so forth. And so if you didn't see those, please uh, look at those videos uh, before this one. But tonight we're finally getting around to the things around which the title comes. Did you know this about the millennium? So we're going to talk about some things that are, are scarcely known, as I put down there, scarcely known facts, things that will occur during the millennium that the Bible shows us. So I'll tell you, as we go through these slides, I just sort of have them listed in no particular order. And some of them have a great deal of biblical support, and some of them have less biblical support. Fewer verses is what I'm getting at. But, but some of them are crystal clear, and some of them, you really need to be a true bond servant of the Messiah and, and have an Hebraic understanding of him and his word in order to see it. But what I'm going to do is try to get them all done within the next hour, try, try to show you these things. And then I will tell you that the very last one is going to require some reading on your own. Uh, it's going to take you to the book of Ezekiel, and you're going to have uh, quite a bit of reading on, on your own there. So I'll, I'll show you that one when we get there. So for now, let's open with a word of prayer, and we're going to begin. Abba, Father, we love you and we welcome you into our home. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to stop and shut the world outside and focus on you. And we pray for your blessings on our time together and on our learning this evening, Father, and that we will take what we learn tonight and, and use it in our witness, in our ministry for you, as we grow in the grace and knowledge of your Son, Yeshua, our Lord and Savior. Amen. All right. Did you know this about the millennium? This is our last part, by the way. Next week we'll go into something new. Well, let's jump right in. First thing, did you know that God is going to reunite both of the houses of Israel in the land? And I put there in, in the yellow, right, Eretz Israel. That's, uh, Eretz is the Hebrew word for the land. And once when I say in the land, I'm talking about in the land of Israel, in the, the promised land that he gave them. And he's going to physically rule over all nations from Jerusalem. Now, earlier in this lesson, I told you that there is absolutely nothing in Scripture that says that he's going to rule from what we physically call Jerusalem today. That is up for debate. There, it, the Scriptures clearly show Jerusalem. They clearly show the land. The exact place, I can't say. If Jerusalem is, uh, is changed in the future during the millennium, I can't say. My personal belief is that it will be Jerusalem as it is today, as it has been for thousands of years. So I kind of wanted to clear that up because I believe it was in part one when we said that there was nothing in Scripture that absolutely says it has to be as it sits today. That is true, but I do believe that we should understand it as Jerusalem as it sits today. We're promised in Scripture that he will sit on his father David's throne, which was in Jerusalem. And I'll show you some, some support for it literally being the Jerusalem that we know on the, on the map today. So Psalm 20 verse 7 tells us that some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of Jehovah our God. And of course that's leading into other biblical support. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 37. I want to read this to you. Ezekiel 37 and verses 15 through 28, where we're going to see evidence of this uniting of the two houses of Israel and his ruling from Jerusalem. So Ezekiel 37, beginning with verse 15, the word of Jehovah came again unto me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, of course, we're in the book of Ezekiel, and if you're familiar with the book, God refers to Ezekiel as son of man uh, quite often in this book. He says, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it. For Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions, then take another stick and write upon it. For Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, 
his companions. So here we see the two houses, Judah and Ephraim. Verse 17, and join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in your hand. And when the children of your people shall speak unto you, saying, Will you now show us what thou meanest by these? Say unto them, Thus says Jehovah God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his fellows, and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in my hand. And the sticks whereon thou writest shall be in thine hand before their eyes, and say unto them, Thus saith Jehovah God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side, and bring them into their own land. Now I want to take a moment here and do a little commentary. This verse is one of the key verses that I, that I believe supports the fact that those of us that understand our Hebraic heritage, those of us who understand that Jesus Christ was a Jew, those of us that understand that the, the, the way to salvation is when God created one new man, and he says there is no more Jew, there, there is no more Greek, there is no male nor female, but one, one new man. Those of us that understand Paul's writings in Romans chapter 2, the last two verses, 28 and 29, when he talks about who is a Jew, when he's speaking of who is a child of God. It is, it is the circumcision of the heart. Those of us who understand that the Torah is binding, that God is the same today as he was when he wrote on the tablets on the mountain of Mount Sinai. Those of us who understand our position in a Hebraic mindset, serving a Hebraic mindset God, will understand this verse as saying that we are indeed a part of the chosen people, we are indeed circumcised of the heart and a Jew, and we are indeed his people, Israel, scattered amongst the heathen. So when it says right here, and let's read that one again, he says, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his fellows, and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick... And I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. This is God saying he will unite the two houses, and those of us of the house of Ephraim who are scattered abroad will be included in this bringing back to our land Israel. Eretz Israel, okay? Moving on with verse 22, And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all, and they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of their dwelling places wherein they have sinned, and will cleanse them, so shall they be my people and I will be their God. And David, my servant, shall be king over them. That right there is a Bible study in itself. Those words. David, my servant, shall be king over them. And they all shall have one shepherd. And they shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. And they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God and they will be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, Jehovah, sanctify Israel when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forever. So, again, this is biblical support for what we're talking about, the, the reunification of the two houses of Israel, and that he will dwell physically in Jerusalem to rule and reign over them. Okay? How are you this evening? That's all right. That's all right. I need a general area. All right. So, 
That's what we see in Ezekiel 37. Let's look at Ezekiel 43, okay? Ezekiel 43, verses 5 through 7. So the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of Jehovah filled the house. And I heard him speaking unto me out of the house, and the man stood by me, and he said unto me, Son of man, the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever, and my holy name, so you know who's speaking. No one in Scripture has a holy name other than the holy. And my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defile, neither they nor their kings by their whoredom, nor by the carcasses of their kings in their high places. And then he, in Zechariah chapter 2, let's look at what Zechariah says, verses 10 through 12. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith Jehovah. And many nations shall be joined to Jehovah in that day, and shall be my people. So again, he's speaking here when he says of many nations, we're speaking of what we just read in Ezekiel 37. He is bringing all of Israel together. He is bringing the heathen, those who have accepted him, who are circumcised of the heart, he's bringing them together to live in the city. And I will dwell in the midst of thee, and thou shalt know that Jehovah of hosts has sent me unto thee. And Jehovah shall inherit Judah, his portion in the Holy Land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. So we're seeing a lot of, of, of Scripture pointing to the literal land of Jerusalem here. Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 3. Thus saith Jehovah, I am returned unto Zion, another supporting scripture there, and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth, and the mountain of Jehovah of hosts, the holy mountain. So this has been one uh, that he will unite and rule from Jerusalem with quite a lot of biblical support. I said up front there are some that have a, a great deal of support, and there are some that don't have as many supporting verses. This is definitely the one with the most uh, support showing it, that definitely his plans for the city and for us, for his people. This one, I know you recognize the first line, if nothing else. We see this one on, on Christmas cards all the time. And um, what we're seeing here, uh, I want you to understand, is two things and not just one. We're in Isaiah chapter 9 now, verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And people typically look at that and see one thing. No, it's two different things. Unto us a child is born, and unto us a son, the Son of God. The Son of God is given unto us. This is a foretelling, a prophecy of exactly what he's going to do for you and for me. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the mighty God. This is one of the verses to which you can always point those who, who argue with you and say that Jesus was not God. Well, then who is the son? Who is the child that was born? Who is the son that was given? Who was it that sacrificed for you? And what does Scripture say that his name will be called? Also, not in, this, uh, not in tonight's lesson, but in other lessons, is when he has promised that his name will be Emmanuel. When in history has he gone by the title Emmanuel? And, 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 and then the scriptures even translate that for us, which means God with us. No time in history has he been referred to as Emmanuel. That prophecy is yet to be fulfilled. That prophecy will be fulfilled during the millennial reign. He will be called God with us. Yes, ma'am. Years. Absolutely. It certainly does. When he was born, when he was sacrificed, and then when the government shall be on the that, And so it's, it's coming. So there's no doubt about who this is. He says, my servant David is going to reign there. And remember that he is called David's son as well. Remember when he uh, faced off against the Pharisees and asked them about David and, and putting the enemies on his footstool. Let's carry on. The everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever, the zeal of Jehovah of hosts will perform this. Now, what did we just read about a throne? Whose throne is he going to sit on? He's going to sit on his father David's throne. Is that where he is right now? Where is he right now? 
He's at the right hand of his father God's throne. He will sit on his father David's throne. All right? He will sit on the throne of David. And so, and, and, and again, this is another little blurb of scripture that is an entire Bible study on, on its own there. But, and so we're not, we don't have time to really focus on that. I just wanted to point that out. Let's keep moving on. The Sabbath. This is another thing I wanted to ask. Did you know this about the millennium? Whether or not you want to recognize the Sabbath now, God tells us in prophecy that you will recognize the Sabbath at some time in the future. He says, uh, in, in response to the question, what would Jesus do? I, I actually have this bumper sticker upstairs in, in my study there. He would call himself Yeshua, first of all, and he would go to the synagogue on the Sabbath. Uh, in fact, if we look at what he did in Scripture, that's exactly what he did. So uh, he didn't change anything. Even after his resurrection, Paul didn't change anything. Paul, as a matter of fact, when, when the Gentiles came to heard Paul speak, when he was done, they approached him and said, Will you speak to us some more? And if you'll notice in Scripture, Paul never said, Sure, I'll come to your church tomorrow morning. He said, No, you come back next week on the Sabbath. So even Paul upheld this. And so I'm not saying there's anything wrong with going to church on Sunday. You, you guys know that. That's not my point. My point is simply that the Sabbath is ordained. The Sabbath has never changed. And scriptures are clear that we will recognize the Sabbath the way God wants it again in the future. In Exodus 31:16, Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. We just talked about Romans chapter 2, uh, the last two verses, 28 and 29. Paul defines who Israel is. If you are circumcised of the heart, he says, who is a Jew? Is it he that circumcised of the flesh? No, it is he who is circumcised of the heart. You are a Jew. Of course, he's meaning Israel in, a, in, a, in its entirety. So when you go back and look at Exodus and you go back and look at the Levitical law, this is something we're commanded to keep as a perpetual covenant. It's something that we need to understand that we should do now, but let's look at prophecy and what's going to happen in the future. Isaiah 66. I took this verse to a pastor when Tricia and I were, were attending a, a, a church from which we were asked to leave uh, because they didn't agree with this, but I took this verse to the pastor and it was literally one of the last communications he and I ever had uh, was I asked him to explain this to me. Clearly, if you read this entire chapter, the context is of a future event, very, very clearly. And when I, I asked him to do that, and he promised that he would research it and get back with me, and it's been about six years now, and I haven't heard from him yet. I'm not really expecting the phone to ring tomorrow either. But it's clear. It's very clear. Isaiah tells us in 66, it shall come to pass. That's future tense. Has it happened yet? No, so I know that it still is future tense. It shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith Jehovah. How do I know it hasn't happened yet? Because I see people in the world that don't worship Jehovah. I see people in the world that claim to be atheists or claim to be any other religion, whatever you want to put in there. So obviously this hasn't happened yet. And so that one's, when, when you give them that, that be, that's a little difficult for, for folks to understand. If you don't understand Scripture from a Hebraic mindset, that's very difficult to understand. Let's see what else we have in store. Did you know that all idols will be gone? All idols will be done away with. They'll be demolished, and they're false religions, and I couldn't help myself, and all political systems, because you know, uh, I, I believe that Islam is a political system. I don't b just believe that because it's my opinion. Uh, they want to implement Sharia law. They want to do away with the United States Constitution in favor of implementing Sharia law. Their Sharia law governs everything they do, not just religious, but politically as well. So all of these will be done away with. Let's see if we can find some support for that. Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. I have heard the reproach of Moab and the revilings of the children of Ammon, whereby they have reproached my people and magnified themselves against their border. 
Therefore, as I live, saith Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab shall be as Sodom. And we all remember what happened in Sodom, don't we? Surely Moab shall be as Sodom, and the children of Ammon as Gomorrah. Even the breeding of nettles and salt pits and a perpetual desolation, the residue of my people shall spoil them, and the remnant of my people shall possess them. So I believe we have a little bit more in Zephaniah. Let's continue. This shall they have for their pride, because they have reproached and magnified themselves against the people of God. God will be terrible unto them, for he will famish all the gods of the earth. And men shall worship him, every one from his place, even all the isles of the heathen. That goes right back to Isaiah 63, uh, 66. All men in all the isles, even all the heathen, shall worship him. But this is a, a, a debate that we've had before. We've talked about gods. You know, on our uh, Jesus is not in the Quran site, one of my favorite talking points there is talking point number five. And it's, it's up to uh, 78 by now, but uh, talking point number five there, the title is God with a capital G, God with a lower case G, and gods. The title is God, God, and gods. And the title goes into this. It says, basically, just to summarize it, it says God, God, and gods are not necessarily individuals, but they're categories. In the category God with a capital G, there's only one individual, and he is the creator God, the true God of the universe. In the category God with a lowercase g, there is only one, and Paul talks about him in Scripture. He calls him the God of this world. He is the man that was beautiful and filled with musical talent and was, was number you know, was, was the highest ranking cherub in heaven until iniquity was found in him and then he was cast out with one third of the angels of heaven. We know him as Satan. Paul makes it clear that he is the God of this world. And then we have the third category, gods, lowercase g-o-d-s. And in that category there are many, many gods. We could sit here and name them for an hour. Chemosh, Molech, Ra. They're all named in scriptures. In scripture, there are many, many of them named. Many exist that are not even named in scripture, such as Zeus, Hermes, Rimen. We can go on and on and on and name them. These are the gods that literally may not be real. But believe me, in the minds of those who worship them, they are as real as the true creator God of the world is to us. They are as real as you are sitting out there looking at me and as I am looking at you. So what we know to be false, when God says here in Scripture that he will famish all the gods of the earth, what he will do is he will make those that worship them realize that they are nothing that they are non-existent. So I really, we could, we, again, there's so much in this lesson and we could, we can do off, off shoot of this, branches of this, and do full length Bible studies on these topics, but we need to continue on. So the curse, did you know that the curse will be gone? You know that we're under the curse right now. The world itself is under the curse. Paul tells us that the world itself is groaning under the curse and everything will be lifted. If you've ever gone outside on a beautiful Saturday morning or Sunday morning or any day of the week, if you've ever gone outside and just been stopped in your tracks by the beauty that is God's creation, I hope the very next thing you think is, praise your name, it's this beautiful under a curse. Just imagine when the curse is lifted, what we're going to experience. Imagine what uh, Adam and Hava, Adam and Eve, experienced in the garden whenever they were there before the, before the curse. The curse on the land will be lifted and the carnivorous animals will no longer eat meat. Here in Isaiah 11, it says, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard will lie down with the kid and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and, and a little child shall lead them. Now I will tell you that it is my belief that it, again if we had time to read the full context of the scripture, 
I do believe that this action, this action by the animals, might be limited to the immediate area of Jerusalem, of the city of Zion, of where God is dwelling on David's throne. It may not be worldwide. Uh, a full reading of Scripture would, would, would show you that, would evidence that for you. But again, another entire Bible study. Miss Kathy, did you want to add something? No, I just want to say something that occurred to me. I'm not going to sit here and say that it's wrong to someone to even share it because I don't think it is. But it just, it just came to my mind that the curse is on the land and the carnivorous is part of that curse. And um, it's not that it, I don't think it's wrong for anybody not to do it, but some people make such a religion of being vegan or vegetarian. Right. And it's almost like that is there is like in your face, God, I will not live under your curse. Well, that's that's a good point. I mean that's I'm not a, saying it is, I'm just saying that it's like sure. it's like a human saying I'm going to be my own God. Right. Yeah, I understand. That's a good point. But we have a little bit more in Isaiah here. He goes on, And the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp. And the winged child shall put his hand in the cockatrice's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy it in all my holy mountain. Which is one of the reasons that I believe, if you take all of this in context, that it is probably limited. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of Jehovah as the waters cover the sea. So the curse is going to be gone. Did you know that the Levites will once again run the temple? This is coming up to some, some really uh, interesting facts here as we go here. Yeshua will reestablish the priests to serve in the temple because he will be unable to serve as the high priest while he's on earth. Why is that? Well, we're going to look, look at some of the other facts and you will see how this happens. Now, I had one verse here, but this is one that I absolutely had to show you the context. A couple of times tonight I've asked you to go back and read the context to understand the point we're making. In this one, I need to show you the context because what we're looking at here will be the last verse, verse 21. Um, but we're, oh, I'm sorry, uh, but this is actually starting up at verse 17. I just forgot to change the numbers down at the bottom of the slide. But he says, For I know their works and their thoughts. As we read this, it will come, clue, come uh, evident who they are. For I know their works and their thoughts that shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues. We've talked about this twice already tonight. Who is he talking about? He's talking about all of those who have been scattered around the world. And those who are joined, as Paul says, grafted in. Okay, that's who he's talking about. And they shall come and see my glory. And I will set a sign among them, and I will send those that escape of them unto the nations to Tarshish, Pool, and Lud, that draw the bow to Tubal and Javon, to the isles afar off that have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. And they shall bring all your brethren. Now, well, let me just finish reading that, then we'll ask this question. And they shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto Yahweh out of all the nations upon horses and in chariots and in litters and upon mules and upon swift beasts to my holy mountain Jerusalem, saith Jehovah, as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel unto the house of Jehovah. And I will also take of them for priests and for Levites, saith Jehovah. Now, we know from the top down, the reason we needed to do this one in context, for I know their works and their thoughts, and I'm going to bring them back to the nations. And then I said, and they shall bring all your brethren for an offering. Who is he talking about, guys? What he's talking about here, all of the tongues, all of the nations, all of those that are either scattered abroad, natural, born, Israel, by blood, and the heathen, the Gentiles, who have heard 
God's call and have accepted and are circumcised of the heart, as Paul says in Romans 2, and are therefore children of God, one new man, one people, if you would, and he's going to bring back, who are they going to bring back? He says, your brethren. Who's he talking to? He's talking to an Israelite, Isaiah, and he's saying that these people will minister to true Israel, those who have denied Jesus as their Savior. He's going, they will bring the true Israel back. And then he says near the end there, as the children of Israel bring an offering and a clean vessel into the house of Jehovah, and I will take of them. Well, who has been the them and the there and so forth throughout this entire passage? You and me. You see, he's going to take you and and me, those, again, those who are circumcised of heart, those Gentiles who are grafted in, he is going to take of them and make them priests. Isn't that what we read in the book of Revelation? That we will reign and rule with him as what? Kings and priests. I know for a fact that's what I look forward to. This goes all the way back to the lesson that we had about the body versus the bride. Do you think for one minute that anyone who, who would have the audacity to say, and, and I know this is a little irreverent every time I use it, it's, 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 it sounds harsh, but it's said to make the point. But do you think for one minute that anyone who would say, thank you for that blood on the cross, but I'm not doing anything for you in return, do you think that they deserve to reign or rule as kings and priests or to have a special intimate relationship with him, with the king, with the king? No. It is those who will be waiting, who will know when the return is coming and who will be ready with their lamps filled with oil who have been walking the walk according to the law, who have been, as we said on the Facebook page this week, hitting the mark. Remember, we talked that the definition of sin is missing the mark. Well, we're going to turn to the left and to the right, but God's word says that it will guide us back towards center all the time. That is who the word them in this last verse is referring to. I will take of them for priests, and for Levites, saith Jehovah. So who's going to run the temple? You and me, us, those who strive to have an intimate relationship with him. He will reward by making you a minister. When I was at Shalom Peniel, and the second night that I was there, and I do that, you guys that have seen me do that many times, but I, I like to poll the audience. I go, who's, who's saved? Raise your hands. And I, you know, everybody raises their hand. Good. Who's in full-time ministry? And I get one or two hands the pastor and you know somebody else, you know, wait a minute, something's wrong. If you raised your hand to the first question, you should be raising your hands to the second question. If you're his, be his. That's how you get to this place. So I hope you understand the context there now and know what he's what he's talking about. And that's why that one that one took some time. You look like you're about to bust. <laughs> The body. Yes. Because if you'll go back to when, uh, in the Old Testament, as when he, uh, when they mm -hmm. came, when they mm -hmm. came in and they were given the land, then they divided up the land to everyone except the Levites did not get land. That's right. Because they were the, they were basically they That's were a, the ones that were brought. That's a very, very good point. Thank you for bringing that out. That's exactly right. If you go back and you look at the book of Numbers, especially, where things were divided out, that the Levites were not given the land. That's exactly right. They were special unto God. All right, let's move on. Did you know that the saints will rule and judge? Well, we just really covered that, didn't we? I mean, on the previous slide, we went into such detail about what we've read in Revelation and our reigning and ruling with Messiah, we've already covered that, but the saints will rule and judge the nations of the earth as well. Daniel, I love the book of Daniel. We really need to do, it's been a few years since we did an in-depth review of Daniel, especially chapter 9, uh, the last four verses of Daniel 9. We really need to do that again soon.
But in Daniel, in Daniel chapter 7, we read, Until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Again, need to go back and read all of this for context for yourself. There's so much in this lesson. There, I'll tell you, there are 16 points here all together. I didn't number them or anything. But there are so many of them that I gave you the actual keys to, to, the, to the points that are being made. But you could spend the next several weeks going back and reading the context of these verses to fully understand what's going on. Daniel continues, Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them. And he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. There's just a lot going on in Daniel here as we continue 25 through 27. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall, uh, shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. Think about that one. Maybe we've already seen some of this beginning. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times for the dividing of time. And of course you know that Daniel... Much like the book of Revelation, when we read of the word times and time, it's speaking of years. Right? But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. So we will be, the saints will be given reign over the nations of the earth during this time. Of course, we've talked this, about this before. Will there be sin during the millennium? Well, you know that there must be because we're told in Scripture that Yeshua will reign and he will rule them with a rod of iron. Why would he need a rod of iron if there was no sin? Of course, it's going to be a time for everyone to learn the laws of God, and, there, and it will, there will be a time of correction. Did you know that the saints will have immortal glorified bodies during the millennial reign? Check this out. This is so cool. The saints will have their glorified immortal bodies just as Yeshua had when he walked through unopened doors after his resurrection. Uh, how do I know that? Well, first of all, they were part of the first resurrection, right? We covered that in Revelation 20. They're a part of the first resurrection. And what was Jesus' body like after his resurrection, which was also a part of the first resurrection? Recall, the first resurrection is not an event. It is a category. Jesus was a part of the first resurrection. Those who got up and walked around the city, which we never talk about, were part of the first resurrection. The first resurrection category, if you would, if you wanted to put bookends of time around it, is still going right now. It started with Jesus. It will end with, what, with the events that we read in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, for the last two times that we met. And, of course, we know what separates it from the second resurrection, the bad resurrection, the resurrection to damnation. So if we look at Jesus, if we just look at Jesus as an example of what we're in store for, but let's look at what Paul says clearly. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, one of my favorite chapters. He says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall, shout, shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and, what's that last part? <laughs> we shall be changed. He says, of course you know, from our previous studies that Paul here is speaking of those of us who will be raised our own resurrection as a part of the first resurrection. But let's see what else Paul has to say here in, in Thessalonians. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, Revelation 20 made it clear that this is going to happen at the beginning of the millennium reign. Did it not? It has to happen at the beginning of the millennium reign because you've also got Satan being bound in the bottomless pit, reserved unto darkness, and at the end of the thousand years is when he has to be loosed. So 
And, and Rev, John in Revelation 20 makes it clear, this is the first resurrection. Speaking of all of the saints being resurrected and Satan being put away, all of those things are happening in the category called the first resurrection. Look at John here in 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, this is the clincher. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know. I love that word. I don't have to go through life thinking, hoping, wondering if I'm saved or what's going to happen to me because John says, but we know that when he shall appear, what does it say? We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So guys, when, when we are a part of this first resurrection, when we are given our resurrection bodies, we will enjoy that just as Jesus did. He walked into the room without opening the door. And by the way, he also did something else very key. I love it. Every time he appeared, what did he do? It has to do with the mouth and the stomach. He ate. He said, where's the food? You know? And think about it. We now know that the curse is lifted. We now know we're going to be with him. We know we're going to have bodies like his. Can you imagine what the food's going to be like? We've never seen a buffet like what we're in store for. All right. Did you know that there will be unbelievers? Well, sure there will be. We've already talked about him ruling with a rod of iron, but there's going to be unbelieving people remaining on the earth. A good read of Scripture will show this to you. Zechariah chapter 14. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, Jehovah of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This goes right back to what we talked about earlier, that all of the feasts will be reinstantiated. And how do I know? Because Scripture tells us that even the heathen are going to turn and worship him and follow his rule. Look at, and Zechariah continues in verses 17 and 18, It shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, Jehovah, even upon them shall be no rain. What would be the reason for them not going? They don't want to worship God. They're still there. They have, for, for some way, they have managed to exist during, the, during this reign. But there, that's R-E-I-G-N, reign of God during the millennial kingdom. And they have decided clearly to disobey God's law and not travel to Jerusalem to uphold the feasts. And he says, upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not that have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith Jehovah will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. That's exactly, well, some will be grafted in if, you can, if we see it that way. Yes, sir. Some will choose to obey. And those that don't, we know that, those, we know that there will be those that don't. Because God has told us that on them there will be no rain. But eventually, all will worship. We know that because we've seen many places in Scripture where it says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. So did you know that all nations will worship the king? Zephaniah chapter 2, Jehovah will be terrible unto them, for he will famish all the gods of the earth. We talked about this a little earlier. And men shall worship him, every one from his place, even all the isles of the heathen. What does the King James mean when it says every one? Yeah, it means exactly that. No interpretation needed. Every one. And so, if we take Scripture seriously, and you know, I don't know, Frederica, if I mentioned this at Shalom Peniel or not, but let me talk about it briefly here. Um, there's a difference between taking Scripture literally and taking Scripture seriously. And I don't generally like to say I take Scripture literally, because then somebody would say, well, then you think God has feathers. Or they could say that, because I'm promised 
that he would take me under his wing like a hen, protecting his chicks, her chicks. So what I do is I take that verse very seriously, and I know that God will protect me like the metaphor that he is creating, and it doesn't mean that he has wings. So I take the scripture very seriously, and when, this, when the scripture tells me that everyone will worship, it's what it means, seriously, and in this case, literally as well. Isaiah 66, 23, we read this one a little earlier, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith Jehovah. And that was the question that I asked the pastor. You know, what about, the, you know, basically I was kind of saying, what are you going to do when this time comes? I'm already trying to recognize it. Why can't you? Was basically what I was getting at. Zechariah 14, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king. Again, we read that just a few slides back. So, we're getting through the points here. Now, this is one, these four verses you saw on tonight's title slide. Micah 4, verses 1 through 4. And you're going to see this slide three times because there's three points upcoming that are all supported by these verses. Okay, So I, I tried to underline the, the key points here. But all, all will worship is supported here in Micah chapter 4. But in the last days... That's how I know it hasn't happened yet. In the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of Jehovah shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it. And many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of Jehovah and to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths for the law shall go forth of Zion. Now wait a minute. I have to ask every time I read this. This started off, but in the last days it shall come to pass. Two questions. Are we in the last days and has it come to pass? No and no. Which means what we're about to read is future tense. And in the future tense we read, the law shall go forth of Zion. So I'm telling you that anybody who would stand in front of you and proclaim the law has been done away with or the law has been nailed to the cross is guilty of leading you astray. That is not supported in Scripture. Yeshua did not walk this earth sinlessly obeying the law that he gave on Mount Sinai for 33 years just to find himself nailed to a tree so that you can have the liberty in Christ to disobey everything. How shameful to live that way and how pathetically shameful to teach and preach others that it's okay to live that way. Not supported in Scripture. The law shall go forth of Zion and the word of Jehovah from Jerusalem and he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up a sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree and none shall make them afraid. For the mouth of Yahweh of hosts hath spoken it. I mean, tell me. Guys, as you read that, is that not a wonderful sentiment to think about living in that environment? Think about that world that Micah painted for us here. What a beautiful, a beautiful surroundings there. So, and again, we will see these four verses again uh, a couple more times tonight. But just to support, all will come up and worship out Zion. All will keep the feasts. We've already kind of looked at this earlier tonight, but again, Isaiah 66, 23, it shall come to pass that all will come to worship before me, he says. And again, from, from one Sabbath to another. Zechariah 14, 16, we saw this one as well. Everyone that is left of the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. All will keep the feasts. 
The dietary laws make a comeback. Did you know this? You know, my stance on the dietary laws is very, very simple. God hasn't changed. God made you. It would be the exact same as if you were an engineer and you built a machine and then you said it needs 5W30 oil. And then you sell that machine to someone and they go and put 10W40 in it and it doesn't work right. When they bring it back to you, you would have all rights to say, I told you what it needed. If you didn't do it right, I can't help you. I heard a pastor one time say this, and I do not agree, so I'm just relaying just as kind of a poke in the eye to, to, to drive the point home. I heard uh, a pastor say, uh, as he was, as he was visit, traveling and teaching somewhere, someone come up and says, will you pray for my husband? You know, he's been really sick or, or something along that line. And he says, well, does your husband obey the dietary laws of the Bible? No, he doesn't. Well, then no, I won't pray for him. That's a little harsh, but it drives the point home. The point that that guy was trying to make was not to be rude or mean or hateful. The point he was trying to make was, why should I intervene for your husband's health if your husband's not even going to intervene for his own health? Start with that. Do it his way. God says there are certain things that we shouldn't eat. Peter's vision did not lift or eliminate those laws. All you've got to do is finish reading and Peter specifically tells you himself, for God has shown me that the Gentile is, oh, it's okay for me to talk to a Gentile. has nothing to do with food. Again, one of those metaphors that God uses. He does that a lot. The dietary laws, I believe, are still in effect for today. I do not follow them all the time. I'm just trying to be honest. We do not follow them all the time, but we know we should. We absolutely know we should. Well, i got to tell you, one day soon we will, whether we want to or not. All the dietary laws will be enforced. Isaiah 66, verse 17. They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst, eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse, shall be consumed together, saith Jehovah. Now, we had this one in another lesson, if you'll remember, and we talked about this, about what an abomination it is. Why does God not want us to eat swine's flesh? Or what does a pig eat? You ever heard the expression, you are what you eat? What does a pig eat? Well, I, I used to, I love, I used to, I still do, I love lobster. But have you ever seen a Discovery Channel show of what the lobster eats? He's a scavenger. He's picking up diseased, rotting um, other animals from the bottom of the ground. You are what you eat. Knowing that he is garbage, why would I want to eat garbage? It, that's the easiest way to look at it. But I do have one final thing to say on this before we move on. Even for those scriptures, like the, people love to quote the one where Jesus says, all things are okay as long as you eat them with thanks. But, and, and I agree, but again, look at Scripture from a Hebraic mindset. If you, if I came to you right now and said, all things are okay for you to eat, there's nothing out there that will hurt you, are you going to have an urge to jump up, go in the front yard, dig up a big fat juicy earthworm and eat it? You know why you would not? Because you've never done that in your life. So when Jesus was standing there and he's talking to Jews, when he says all things are okay to eat, none of them, not Jesus, nor anybody who physically heard his voice, none of them said, hot dog, where's the next barbecue restaurant? I want a barbecue sandwich. None of them would think of that because to them, the pig is just as dirty and disgusting as is the earthworm to you today. Think about it in context. That is not what Jesus meant. Think about Scripture from a Hebraic point of view and you'll understand what we're talking about a lot better. No Jerusalem, no rain. We talked about this. This one we've already read once. If able-bodied males don't visit Jerusalem during the Feast of Tabernacles, which just passed, by the way, as we're having this lesson tonight, there will be no rain in their land. Recall we saw that in Zechariah. 
It shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king. And we come down, it shall be that those who, who, that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, Jehovah of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. And it will continue and get worse that they will be stricken with a plague as well. So, when this occurs, God is serious. God is going to want us to do it His way. He, in fact, He wants that right now. I should say, when this occurs, God is going to force us to do it His way. Right now, we still have a choice. That's why we should study Scripture like we're doing here tonight, and we should implement these things now. Did you know there's going to be a long lifespan again? You know, when you go reading in Genesis and you read about the, the people that lived hundreds of years, and you know, of course, that Methuselah was the longest, the, the, the oldest man to ever live, and, and we just look at this and, you know, he's 400 years old and still having children. That's going to return. That is going to, part of the reason it's going to return, the curse is going to be lifted, you're going to follow the dietary laws, we're going to do things God, God's way, therefore all of the machines that he has built are going to be maintained the way the Creator ordered them to be maintained, and this is what he meant all along. But how do I know that they're going to live for hundreds of years? Scripture plainly tells us. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people, and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that is not filled his days, for the child shall die a hundred years old. You know what that means plainly? Again, King James is not always the friendliest to get the point across. But what he's talking about is a hundred year old man dies and people are going to wonder why did he die so young? The child will die a hundred years old but the sinner, now listen, another reason I know that during this time there will be unbelievers but the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed and they shall build houses and inhabit them and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. So it's going to be a wonderful, joyous time. I tell you, I almost kind of hope that I'm alive when the millennium reign begins. Because it would be so cool to just, to just walk right into it. Would it not? Go to work that morning, come home, we're in the millennium reign. That would be retirement. Amen. Well, actually, I think what we've learned tonight is he's going to put you to work, brother. <laughs> All right. Let's see what else we've got. And we are, um, we are almost done. Uh, uh, Isaiah 65, a little bit more on this long lifespan. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people. And my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain nor bring forth for trouble. For they are the seed of the blessed of Yahweh and their offspring with them. As soon as you read that, the days of a tree, you know that that's going to be a long, long time. That's incredible. Did you know there will be no more weapons? I got to admit, this one, this one kind of bums me out because I love my gun collection. <laughs> but we won't need them. There will be absolutely no call for a weapon at that point. They will be changed into peaceful elements. Again, we read this earlier in Micah 4, verses 1 through 4, so I'm not going to read the whole thing again. I just draw your attention to the parts I've underlined, and they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. That's going to be retirement for all the world's soldiers. But, but amen to that. I can't wait until the day that I can come home if we still have television then. I don't know if we will or not. But if we turn on the 6 o'clock news, it won't be stories about war. It won't be the stories that I'm hearing every day lately. Somebody shot somebody. I put a note on, on Facebook today. I just got fed up with it. I heard on the news early this morning another shooting and I just put three lines on our, on our ministry site today. 
Um, I forget exactly the way they were worded, but to paraphrase it, um, another, another shooting, uh, if you want to get, get rid of the shooting, the answer is not to take the guns away from the law-abiding citizens. The answer is to put God back in the schools. The reason it's so prevalent now is because we took him out 40 years ago and these kids have gone to school, the teachers can't discipline them, the parents won't discipline them, and they don't, they have to be shut away from God all day every day because we won't let God in the front door of the school. So they grow up as heathens, as punks, and they think nothing of taking another life. You want to fix this? My 40 year plan for fixing it, put God back in the schools tomorrow, in 40 years this will go away. People will grow up with responsibility and the love of God again. They have but no brain. They have no thought. That's, well, yes, ma'am. That's exactly right. Did you know that Yeshua himself will teach? Yeshua will be the teacher. You won't come to Bible studies anymore and hear me because I'm going to be sitting out there learning right along with all of us. And people are going to travel great distances to hear him just like they did the first time he came. We read this already, again, back to Micah chapter 4, but we read this here that as they come, it says, He will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. Who do you think the scripture is talking about there? He will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths. The king himself will teach. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. And this is the last one. And I've got to tell you, this is the one with the most scriptural support. And because of that, I'm going to let you read it on your own. I'm kind of giving you homework here, okay? And no, next week we won't go over your homework because we're going to be on a different subject. But I'm telling you that the temple will be reconstructed and the one you may or may not have heard before, you may or may not have believed before, but I'm telling you that animal sacrifices will be reinstated during the millennial reign. And of course the objection is, wait a minute, you're not my... my my sa I'm, I'm a child of God. I'm, Jesus Christ is my Savior. His sacrifice was once and for all. Why do we need to do sacrifices again? Do you recall earlier tonight when I said that there's, he's going to reunite the houses and take of the nations and of the tongues for priests and for Levites because he will not be able to serve as our high priest during this time? There's reasons for that. There are law-bound reasons for the role that he will play during the millennial reign. There are equally law-bound reasons for his reinstating priests to do these things. And there are equally law-bound reasons for the animal sacrifices being reinstated. So, as I said, there's a great deal of scripture that talks about this. There's even more than I've got on this slide right here, but this is the jackpot of scripture. Ezekiel 40 through 48. That's nine chapters. That's why we're not going to read them all tonight. Ezekiel 40 through 48, but the focus, the, the real crusp, crusp of this is Ezekiel 43 verse 18 to Ezekiel 46 24. And I'm going to turn to Ezekiel 43 right now, and I'm just going to read a couple of those verses. Ezekiel 43, and beginning at verse 18. Just to show you, this is the, uh, if, if we say that Ezekiel 40 through 48 is our target, this subsection is our bullseye, okay? Ezekiel 43, beginning at verse 18. And he said unto me, Son of man, Thus saith Jehovah God, These are the ordinances of the altar in the day when they shall make it to offer burnt offerings thereon and to sprinkle blood thereon. And thou shalt give to the priests the Levites that be of the seed of Zadok, which approach unto me to minister unto me, saith Jehovah God, a young bullock for a sin offering. And thou shalt take of the blood thereof and put it on the four horns of it and on the four corners of the settle and upon the border round about. Thus shalt thou cleanse 
and purge it. Now, that's where I'm going to stop reading. I just wanted to show you the, the real crux of this. And I want you, as you read Ezekiel 40 through 48, when you look at these instructions God has given as he's defining these ordinances for the animal sacrifices and so forth, go back to Leviticus and look at the same ordinances that he applied during the times of Moses and Aaron. Go back and look at what he applied then. Look at what you know Scripture says will be applied in the future and compare them. It really is simple. It really is as simple as understanding that God, at the end of Malachi, or Malachi, if you're Italian, I love that, when he says, I change not, he meant it. When he said in Leviticus, when he outlined for Moses and for Aaron the ways that he wanted the sacrifices to happen, the responsibilities of the priests and of the high priest in the temple, he meant it for that day and forever. Granted, there is a reason we're not doing them now. There is a reason that we will in the future. What we need to understand is that this is what's in store for us whether or not we physically die before the millennium. If we do not die, we'll walk right into it and this will begin. If we do die, we will be resurrected into it and this will begin. This is for you. This is for me. This we will experience. So that was our last slide. I've got our, our question slide up there. Uh, Frederica, just so, so, so you know, we will do a, we do have a Q&A and fellowship time, but just so we can stop the recording uh, and, and so we can put the lesson on the internet, uh, what we do now is I'll go ahead and, and close with a word of prayer. And as I'm closing, folks, if you're watching this video on the internet, if this message has meant anything at all to you, this is our invitation slide. This is the slide that I would like. If you feel that Jesus Christ is calling you into his service, if you feel that you want to repent and, and accept him as your Lord and Savior, as I close this message in prayer, I urge you to read this. And if it touches your heart, do it right now. Get on your knees and accept Him as Savior, and then let us know through our ministry sites, please. Abba, Father, we love You, and we thank You, Lord, for this so true and clear understanding of Your Word, Father. We know what's in store. You've told us what's in store. We pray, Father, for Your strength and for, for You to, to instill in us a desire to be what You want us to be even now, Father. Don't allow us to go through life and then, and then just have to change to conform to what you want us to be. Let us go through life with a desire, a will, and a way to change to conform to what you want us to be, Father. Let us understand now what it is you would have of us and show that in our walk and in our witness now, regardless of what the world thinks of us, Father. If we are in accordance with your word, then we are in accordance with you. Father, we love you, and as always, we close with a special prayer request for those who are serving our nation around the world in uniform, Father. We pray that you would protect them on the battlefield, that you would bring them home safely, and that right soon, Father. And in the meantime, Lord, un until, that is, until that is possible, if there's one that does not know you as, does not know your Son as Lord and Savior, send someone there right now, Father, we pray. Introduce them to your Son. And call them into your service, Father, and make them strong ambassadors as you are doing for us. We ask this in the name of your Son, Yeshua, our Lord and Savior. Amen.